Just start with Adam, okay? I'm early. I'd like to reconvene the October 22nd, 2019 meeting of the Marine Resources Commission. Next item on the agenda is item number 13, public hearing proposal to establish emergency amendment as a permanent part regulation pertaining to Amberjack and Cobia. Mr. Gear. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Commissioner. Yeah, this is a public hearing to establish the emergency amendments as permanent part of a regulation of Chapter 4, VAC 
510-10 pertaining to Amber, Jack, and Cobia to address closing state waters as a result of the recent closure of federal waters for commercial Cobia. Uh, for the third year in a row, NOAA Fisheries announced that they were going to close federal waters just a few days um, after one of our um, commission meetings, so we've had to do an emergency emergency amendment to close our, our state waters as well to try to uh, coincide with that. Uh, we did that in September at our September 24th commission meeting. It was approved, and if, um, and if you approve the um, changes today as permanent, they will become, if you, the regulations will become permanent as of today. Uh, on August 28th, they announced that they were going to cl close um, commercial fishing for the Atlantic Migratory um, Group of Kobe, which is Georgia through New York, which, um, and it, they thought it would be to exceed the 50,000 pound um, allowable catch limit. Uh, that ch that was going to take effect September 4th. The closure affected only the commercial fleet and the federal waters. Uh, Virginia decided to close state waters effective October 1 to avoid uh, landing Kobe's during this federal closure and, and uh, try to limit the coastwide overages as well. Looking at some background from Virginia so far to date, as of October 15th, we've harvested 21,902 pounds. There will, will be some late reports to come in at some point, but that's what we have right now. Um, North Carolina, we don't have the numbers for them at this point, but they average about 37,000 pounds over the last five years. So those two states combined make up 92% of the commercial harvest the past five years, and those two states alone exceed the, the annual ACL of 50,000 pounds. Um, the September, having September 30th as being the last fishing day of the season uh, for commercial fishing also coincides with the rec recreational sector, which will close on September 30th, and it should be neg negligible impact to commercial sector because less than 1% of the harvest occurs between October and December. And you can see from this graph um, the low percentages of harvest that occur in October and December. It's very low. Um, the season has closed uh, in December in 2014, and uh, for the last three years, we've closed on September 30th. We have, uh, we have two regulatory changes we're making. The first is an administrative change. Uh, when we were updating this regulation, staff noticed edits were necessary to Section 20, which is page 2 of the regulation. Uh, on, August, uh, on April 1st, 2018, Section 20, subsection C, prohibiting gaffing of COBIA was removed, removed but uh, that section was removed, but the title was not removed. So the section in uh, red, which is the title, will be removed. And now uh, section 4 VAC 20, 510, 20, um, 510.20 will read recreational fishery possession limits, seasonal closing, and vessel allowances. Uh, and the main, the main um, purpose for this was to uh, look at the commercial fishery and possession limit of season. And all we were changing is we're changing um, subsection B, which it was 2018 before. We're changing that to 2019, and we'll read, in 2019, it shall be unlawful for any person fishing commercially to harvest or possess any cobia after September 30th. And the staff is recommending the commission establish these emergency amendments as a permanent part of regulation to Chapter 4, VAC 20-510-10, pertaining to Amberjack and cobia to modify the season closing date of the commercial cobia fishery. This will be the last year we have to do it this way because uh, the federal government will no longer be involved with uh, the seasonal closures. It's moving over to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and we will have to manage our quota accordingly. So we will uh, be probably coming forward the commission in the spring to uh, some regulations as far as commercial reporting. Questions of Mr. Gear by members of the commission? Somewhat of a semi-permanent regulation yeah. amendment. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Questions? I have a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Neal. Uh, Kobe fish has been really good. Yeah. And um, this year, you know, we did it last year too. This emergency regulation, closing it, and that kind of thing. And uh, you know, it was kind of just a paperwork thing. This year, it actually did something. Uh, the Kobe were still here. Uh, mm. in, well into October, it was. It was kind of. An, it's there. They're showing up earlier. They're staying later. Yeah. And, uh, and so we, we actually did something because the, the recreational guys were still just catching, releasing them after that October first. And a lot of guys, you know, catching them off Virginia Beach. Yeah. 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 And then Quite a few catches off Virginia good. Beach. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tell them to talk to the croaker. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Maybe the Kobe ate them all. Yeah, really, could have. Any further questions or comments? 
Okay, pursuant to the code, this is a public hearing for this matter. Does anyone in the public wish to be heard on this matter for or against? They're seeing none. The matter's before the commission. Dr. Neal. Move to approve staff recommendation. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Second by Mr. France or Tanker or both. Whichever one you want to put down, Jamie. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Next you. item on the agenda is item 14. This is a request for an emergency amendment. Emergency request to amend for VAC at, at, to pertaining to Scup or Porgy. Ms. Ramsey. Good afternoon, Commissioner, Commission members. Okay, due to the timing of the announcement from National Marine Fisheries Service and our commission meetings, um, this is a request for an emergency amendment. Um, this is because the winter two period for SCUP opens October 1. So this is the proposal to amend Chapter 4, VAC 20-910, pertaining to SCUP, to decrease the trip limit from 28,500 pounds to 27,000 pounds for the commercial winter two period fishery which runs October 1 through December 31st. On September 30th, National Marine Fisheries Service published an in-season adjustment to the winter two commercial scup quota and the federal landing limit. Virginia's commercial possession limit for winter two will need to be decreased in order to mirror the federal possession limit of 27,000 pounds. Just a little bit of background, the commercial scup fishery is managed by an annual coastwide quota, which is divided into three periods. The winter one period has a federal possession limit of 50,000 pounds, which we also mirror in our regulation. The summer period um, is state specific and Virginia has a 5,000 pound possession limit. The winter two period, which, it, which we are now currently in, which runs October 1 through December 31st, is subject to change depending on a rollover um, from winter one, any unused quota can roll over to the winter two period. For 2019, the initial quota for the winter two period, now this is coastwide, um, it was 3.8 million pounds. There is gonna be a rollover of 5.2 million pounds from the unused quota from winter one so the revised quota will be 9 million pounds for the winter two period. Um, what National Marine Fisheries does is that they, f from the FMP, they are allowed to take 1,500 pounds and add it to the trip limit of winter two for every 500,000 pounds that is unused from winter one. So this year that equates to a 27,000 pound trip limit. Section 45 of the SCUP regulation, Section B, the only change will be changing the 28,500 pounds to 27,000 pounds. Steph recommends the commission adopt these emergency amendments described in Chapter 4 of VAC 20-910 pertaining to SCUP to decrease the trip limit from 28,500 pounds to 27,000 pounds per trip for the commercial winter two period fishery of October 1 through December 31st, staff also recommends the commission advertise these emergency amendments as part of a November 2019 public hearing to incorporate the amendments as part of permanent regulation. I'll take any questions. And I presume this is being adopted pursuant to section 28.2210, which indicates it's necessary for the protection of the seafood industry? Yes, sir. Okay. Questions? Thank you, Ms. Ramsey. Thank you. This is not a public hearing. This is an emergency regulation, but if there's anyone in the audience that wishes to be heard, I'll be glad to hear you <clears throat> on this matter. They're seeing none. The matter's before the commission for action. Mr. Move France. To, move to adopt the emergency regulation. Motion made by Mr. France to move or to adopt the emergency regulations. There a second. I'll second. Second by Ms. Everett. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is item 15, public hearing pertaining to sharks. Mr. Gillingham, good day, sir. Good day, Commissioner and Associate Commissioners. Yeah. 
fly. I wish it was set. I wish it was set up like mine. I just came down here and hit this. No. Yep. Okay. Today it is a public hearing, and this is a proposal to amend 4 Vac 20-490 pertaining to sharks to revise the minimum size, minimum recreational size limit for Atlantic short fin sharks. Oh. Uh, what I want to do this time is to provide a quick background overview, how we got where we are today. Versus the anatomy and physiology of a shark. Uh, but I'm saving that because I, <laughs> okay, I didn't take time to really answer it completely, but I will this time. 2017, ICAT determines that the short fin, I should say ICAT, henceforth referred to as the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, ICAT determines that the short fin mako stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring. ICAT concludes that short fin mako landings must be reduced by 72 to 79% to prevent further declines in the stock. ICAT adopts measures requiring all member nations to end overfishing and take steps to rebuild the stock, which we're where we are with striped bass almost. NOAA Fisheries responds with short-term emergency measures in March of 2018 that included an 83-inch minimum fork length size limit for recreational caught mako sharks. 83 inches corresponds to a female shark's maturity schedule. In May of 2018, NOAA addressed the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission's Coastal Shark Management Board and requested the board consider acting on their short-term emergency measures, but the board deferred until the measures were finalized in Amendment 11. They knew the measures were going to change, and they, by the time Atlantic States could go through their process, they'd probably just have to turn around and amend it again. And the real fishery exists in federal waters. Um, in the ensuing year, NOAA gathers public input, and then finalizes their long-term measures for Amendment 11 that include an 83-inch fork length minimum for female sharks and a 71-inch minimum for male short fin mako sharks. Then in May of this year, the Coastal Sharks Management Board adopted the new size limits for short fin mako sharks that would apply in state waters and sets a compliance date of January 1, 2020. These new size limits are designed to provide consistency in state waters with federal regulations and will facilitate enforcement and conservation. The public notice has been advertised and no public comments have been received at this time. I'd say I'm not surprised because again, the fishery takes place in federal waters and they are tied to whatever's in, in place in those waters. Plus they have to have a shark endorsement license as well to their HMS permit. The substantive changes to Chapter 4 of Act 20-490 are located on page 6 of the draft regulation. Because this is, it is a public hearing, I've got it on the screen so everyone <coughs> can see it. It's pretty simplistic. We just changed the numbering. This is now item 1. What was 1 and 2 are now 2 and 3. It now reads, it shall be unlawful for any person to possess any recreational caught short fin mako shark that is less than 83 inches in fork length or any male short fin mako shark that is less than 71 inches in fork length. And yes, there is a long fin mako shark and it is on the pro prohibited species list. So it is imperative that we stipulate short fin mako. Staff recommendation is we request the commission approve amendments to Chapter 4 Vac 490-10 pertaining to sharks to amend the recreational minimum size limits for short fin mako sharks to an 83-inch straight line fork length for females and a 71-inch straight fork line length for males. Normally, I'd ask for any questions, but since uh, Mr. Tankard had such a good one last time, I wanted to give you the full. <laughs> We have to, we'll go through this again, but notice in that ensuing year when NOAA Fisheries was collecting comments, one of the things the fishermen asked for is, hey, the males don't get as big, they mature in all, almost half the time of the females, couldn't you essentially cut us some break and let us take at least those male sharks? A female at 83 inches, about 240 pounds, the male 
at, 80, at 71 is about 130 pounds, so they're not baby sharks. So again, we get into the anatomy, okay? The age, what is the age of a shark like that? The females mature 18 to 21 is the latest, at, whereas the males are eight to 10 year olds. They're still typical sharks, a long time to maturity. Um, females, even longer, they're larger, and they suggest that they live about 30 years. So, um, this is that stylized shark, even has spines on it, so you can refer to it if you're talking about a spiny dogfish. But this is kind of the, the area in question, and that's the male clasper or copulating organ. It's one thing about sharks and rays, they have internal fertilization. This is the ventral side of a typical shark. Um, shows you the same pelvic and anal fin, and this is a female, and this is what a, a male in a live photo looks like, and this is the same for a female. So with that, I'll entertain any questions. Any questions? I've got one. Sure. Okay. Overfished, overfishing is occurring. Playing a little roulette, rolling the dice again. Why is why this under a moratorium at this point? Um, politics is part of it, probably. I mean, it is a very important uh, part of the primarily commercial catch. As you get farther north, is a very uh, is a much bigger recreational f fishery here. For us in the offshore fishery, it's real. I call it a bycatch. You're trolling for billfish. You're trolling to, for marlin. You got heavy mono leader and you'll land some of these things and people like to eat them. They're amazing animals. I mean, they, they grow to a thousand pounds, yeah. 45, 50 miles they an get hour. A, they get a chance. Yeah, so exactly. Doc, Dr. Neal? Uh, the the ICAT technical committee, that is their recommendation, is is a moratorium. And and, it, and just like Lewis said, it was politics is, is why it's, it's kept open. And from the U.S. standpoint, it was it was a lot was the tournaments, the, yep. the shark tournaments. They wouldn't be able to. Eat. We, but sorry. the scientists said close it. Okay. Yeah. We do account for about 11 percent of the overall removals in the Atlantic grouping. So we're not a small player, but we're not the largest. Further questions. Well, I have one question. Yes, sir, Mr. Tankard. When you, when you mention that, I mean, is it, is it, does it behoove us to, to do something more thoughtful than our um, national counterparts or the scientists from uh, ICAT? Yeah, they said close. This, this really closes it. Uh, there are not many of us out there going to be rolling over a live mako to see if it's a male or a female. Uh, we, we used to keep them. We don't keep them on our boat anymore. We just, we just let them go because these are real sharks when they get to be this size and, <laughs> and they have a bad attitude and uh, they, you know, so we're, not, we're not trying to, we're, we're not sexing them. So, yeah. 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 It's a great game fish. It's, it can yeah. jump as high as 30 feet and you don't want that coming down next, anywhere near your boat yeah. if possible. But my question remains. Is it, would, would it, in fact, be worth us taking one step further? Lewis? I, I can't. I can tell you from the LPS survey, which is a large pelagic survey, we don't, they don't encounter very many mako sharks. Um, it's what's in effect now in federal waters, it really reduces the recreational catch. Well, I'm, and, and if, if, if it's necessary to move this along I, and it's a tie vote, I'll vote for it. But I'll tell you, I, I see no purpose whatsoever in taking an animal such as that out of the water, and especially from a tournament perspective. I think it's just wrong, plain wrong. But that's my opinion. This is a public hearing again. Anyone wish to be heard? They're seeing none. The matter's before the commission. Mr. Tanker? I'd move to close the fishery. I agree with you. Why, why the heck should we be doing it? I think we, maybe that's the reason to have a bad attitude where we're fishing. <laughs> um, I'm not so sure that we can do that at this juncture. I think under the regulatory scheme, we cannot do anything more stringent than what, been than what has been advertised. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would say there's, there's a little wiggle room where, like, 
maybe if you wanted to increase it a little bit more, maybe. But, like, increase the minimum size, I mean, maybe, maybe. But shutting down the fishery, yeah, we would have to explicitly advertise that. But I like your idea. It's a pleasure to the commission. Then I'll make a motion to accept staff recommendation. Motion made by Dr. Neal to accept staff recommendation or second? Second. Second by Mr. Ballard. Further discussion? My further discussion is I don't disagree with Ed, and, and, and I think that's where we're going. I think eventually ICAT will shut, shut it down, but it's going to take a little bit more political maneuvering. Um, well, perhaps in the, in, the, in the future we can be a little more um, – Given your presentation and what we know now, if we move into another year without any motion on the part of ICAT, we can we can take that further step and, and go with the moratorium. So we would advertise for that in the future. Right. Motion made and second. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify saying aye. 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 All opposed? Me. Motion carries. Thank well, you. Can I go with a nay on that sure. too? You can change your vote. <laughs> that, you have that, uh, Jamie? Okay. Thank you, Lewis. Next item on the agenda is item number 16 pertaining to Tautog. What the Tog? Whichever one you want to prefer. So we have like, actually narrowed it down to fellow, thanks to my fellow Rhode Island schoolie, uh, Jill Ramsey. We both say to Tog, okay. so it's got to be a Rhode Island thing. Okay, it's probably one of those in the dictionary that's got two of the. Anyway, go ahead. Say potato, I say potato. Correcto. Proceed, please. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, Commissioner, afternoon, members of the Commission. Uh, this is a public hearing on Proposed Amendments, Chapter 4, VAC 2960, <coughs> pertaining to TATOG, to establish a commercial TATOG permit and Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission mandated tagging system. The issue that came up a few years ago was a couple of the states, um, mostly in New England, have been having law enforcement issues with illegal and undersized TATOG. Part of this is because the live market which has been growing recently, values the smaller fish. ASMFC recommended a tagging program to increase accountability and approved Amendment 1, which required all commercial to TOG be tagged after January 1, 2020. ASMFC recommended that the tag chosen need to stay on fish, uh, live and dead, not impact the appearance or the condition of the fish as they may live in tanks for several months, and had to be difficult to forge or reuse. In image one, you can see the tags that were chosen, along with the applicator with, with which they are applied to the operculum. Are they, are they numbers or what, what are, I see some indentions in the so picture, I can't tell what they are. that is, that was a trial run, uh -huh. there are numbers. Uh -huh. The tags that our harvesters will receive will have a V for Virginia, right. the year, and a tag number. Okay, thank you. Uh, in images two and three, you can see with an old applicator, um, which was revised later, the tag being applied, and four is how the tagged to tag will look. So the commercial permit, uh, which we have gone before FMAC on, uh, this regulation has been before the Regulatory Review Committee, and we have also spoken with members of the industry, but have not received any formal comments on. Any commercial harvester can get a permit and tags. There will be a $25 fee to offset program costs. VMRC will distribute tags based on a permittee's historical harvest or a minimum amount if no harvest. To tag are often an opportunistic species, not necessarily targeted, but may be caught in uh, pots, uh, hook, commercial hook and line, haul seine, and then the harvesters sell them. And then permittees may request more tags when running low. There is no quota aspect to this. It is just accountability. And as I said previously, the tags will have this information on it. To tag in Virginia, to tag landed in Virginia must be tagged with Virginia tags. Uh, the fish will be tagged with a current year from January 1 to December 31st. And the tag number will be applied to a particular permit. There will be no transfers or agents. January 1, permittees must start using the New Year's tags. 
By February 15th, all previous year's tags must be returned or accounted for to the commission. Fish tagged prior to January 1st with the previous year's tags may be sold through the end of February. This allows for the live market where often tatog caught in November, December are held until typically Chinese New Year when the market value rises. Each year for the last few years, about 17 to 25 harvesters have landed to tog. In 2018, there were only five. We conducted a harvester survey. We received uh, 80 replies, mostly from commercial hook and line fishermen. 22 say they have previously sold to tog, but 50 said they will want a permit and tags, demonstrating the opportunistic nature of the fishery. For context, these are the commercial landings of Tatog in Virginia. It has been declining. Um, I'm informed by members of the industry that this is due to market. Um, I guess part of what we're, the tagging program is addressing is illegal sale, and they said that has really been cutting into the price our harvesters can receive. And then on a coastwide scale, Virginia's landings are this orange bar down here. We are not a major player. So in addition to minor changes made to the purpose, definitions, and recreational sections, staff has added section 48 for commercial permitting and tagging requirements, section 49 for commercial reporting, and section 60 for sanctions. I'll summarize the additions in each of these new sections. On page one of the regulation, the effective date is changed to January 1, 2020. We updated the purpose and added the definitions seen here. Changes were also made on page three to section 45, which will be reflected later in the regulation. The new section 48, commercial permitting and tagging requirements, starts on uh, page three of the regulation. Subsection A creates the Tatog commercial permit. B says all Tatog taken for commercial purposes must be tagged prior to landing and dictates how the tags are applied to the fish. C says the dealers and processors cannot deal in untagged Tatog. On page four, subsection D makes illegal the sale of Tatog with expired tags after the last day of February. Harvesters may only land Tatog with Virginia tags but to tog tagged in other states may be possessed for the purpose of resale. Subsection F says, as mentioned earlier, that tags cannot be transferred or used by an agent. <coughs> Since a year's tags were distributed in the previous year and accounted for in the following year, subsection G forbids possession of tags on board a vessel if they are not for the current year. Subsection H, which says the possession of Tatog greater than the recreational possession limit are considered to be for commercial purposes, was moved from section 45 of this regulation, which is the recreational section. And then it is also illegal to possess more Tatog than tags in the harvester's possession. On page five of the regulation, subsection J forbids the reuse of tags. K establishes the $25 tag fee and L states that all unused tags must be returned by February 15th and any unused tags not returned must be accounted for by submitting an affidavit and or paying a fine. Starting on page five, the new section 49, commercial reporting, harvesters will need to report the number of tags used daily and subsection B closes the exemption in 4 VAC 20-610-60K which says fish caught in federal waters and sold to federally permitted dealers do not need to be reported to VMRC. These trips where Tatog are landed do, uh, will need to be reported in order for staff to account for the tags used. And starting on page six of the regulation is the new section 60 for sanctions. Any person who fails to submit reports or return unused tags cannot receive a commercial permit in any following year until they resolve the issue by submitting their reports, submitting an affidavit, or paying the processing fee for lost tags. Any person who has been found guilty of violating this regulation cannot receive additional tags and may have their permit revoked upon review by the commission. Staff recommendation is to amend chapter four VAC 20-960 pertaining to TATOG to establish a commercial TATOG permit and ASMFC mandated tagging system. And I can take any questions. Any questions? Can you do me a favor and go back a couple of pages? I just want to look at something to make sure. That's good right there.
Okay, so 610 tells you when you shall report the daily harvest. Not because it says we shall report daily harvest of talk. It's a little ambiguous as long as 610 tells you when you report your daily harvest, and that is what, monthly? Yes, it's monthly you report your okay, daily harvest. I, I can't keep it on. I just want to make sure it wasn't report daily the harvest of Tata. I was just, anyway, okay. I'm going to confuse things, but then again, I don't want to get questions that are confusing. Any questions? Again, thank you, Alexa. Thank this you. is a public hearing. Anyone wish to be heard on this matter? Mr. Ludford, please, sir, come forward. Good afternoon, sir. State your name for the record, please. Yes, sir. Chris Ledford, Commercial Hook and Line Fisherman. Uh, question also on that federal um, waters. They still going to need the tags, correct? Even though they said there was a little bit different reporting system. I'll get as long as it's landed in I'm Virginia. I'm going to get the Tatog expert to come up here and, and answer that question okay. on the record. Because if I do, I All think right. I know the answer, but I'm, right. I'm going to rely Did on you the answer. Your question? Uh, question is, um, if they're landed in federal waters, there was a that last, as a matter of fact, that the commissioner wanted to see. Um, at the bottom of that, it says something to the effect outside of the tidal waters would be part, reported through mandatory, you know, reporting. They still have to have the tags, correct? Yes. All to talk landed, landed in, in Virginia, Virginia requires right. Virginia tags. Okay. That's good. Appreciate it. All right. That, that's my one question. And then to comment on the fishery, just something, um, we have a lot of new commissioners. As you know, I've been fishing, you know, hook and line fishing for a long time. Came to my first VMRC meeting in 1989. Um, the characterization, characterization of this fishery um, having being less is, is a reflection of a couple of things. Number one, um, bait struggles because of the crabbing, no winter dredge fishery, we don't have access to bait. Blue crab, um, especially females, is a preferred bait. Um, a couple of the highliners that used to be and the people who taught me to fish in the winter have passed on. Joe Mazell and then um, another um, captain, I can't remember his name, out of Little Creek. Anyway, there's a few of us that still taw tog fish, taw tog, from time to time, and then um, you know, so that's it. So you know, what I what I don't want to do is 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 have you know today, you know, be the entire, you know, impression for the commissioners of what our taw tog fishery is in Virginia. You know, opportunistic is all fisheries. You know, we have to be opportunistic and capitalize on, you know, what we can make a dollar at, you know, and what we can make a profit at. So the fact that Taw Tog right now is, is maybe not being capitalized on is not a reflection of, of the health of the fishery or the health of the fishermen and women. It's just the fact that they've choos chosen to do other things, maybe a lack of bait. Um, a lot of the Taw Tog landed in Virginia also came from the offshore sea bass fishery, which has been um, curtailed due to regulation and is currently rebuilding. Um, so, you know, just would like you all to remember that. You know, moving forward, it's kind of like the cobia, which we're going to have a lot to do with. You know, looking at quotas and history is not always the best indicator, as far as, especially to set the mark going forward. You know, we don't want to push people out of a fishery, push them into other fisheries. Um, you know, Virginia has always been proactive in taking, um, you know, being a keeping a healthy taw tog fishery. Unfortunately, taw tog are caught by a lot of out-of-state boats, especially Maryland, just like wreck fish, and we've had this discussion, the tile fish, they come into Virginia waters, Virginia offshore waters, sometimes Virginia nearshore waters, and then they land those fish, our fish, back in Maryland. Um, but that's going on with spot, croaker, and everything else, another pet peeve of mine. We'll get to that later. But anyway, I don't want to take too much of your time. Your day's going well, um, but please keep that in mind. It's another opportunity. A lot of people depend or did in the past and may in the future depend on TOG. I'm glad that they you know, are doing this to keep the fishery more um, uh, monitorable, if you will. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the perspective, Chris. I appreciate that. Anyone else wish to be heard? <clears throat> Seeing none, the matter's before the commission. Move to approve staff recommendation. Motion made by Dr. Neal, seconded by Mr. Tankard. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Next item is recommendation from Recreational Fishing Advisory Board on funding from VSRFDF. Good afternoon, Lisa. Good afternoon. These are the recommendations from the Recreational Fishing Advisory Board. We just finished up our funding cycle um, last month for 2019. 
The Recreational Fishing Advisory Board advises the Commission on expenditures from the Recreational License Fund, the VSRFDF. Um, estimated funds available this year for projects are just over $1.2 million. We had our final review meeting on September 12th, and the board voted unanimous, unanimously to recommend funding all 13 requests. Not to cut to the chase. So for our 2020 fishing events, we have eight events this year. These are all reoccurring annual events. Most of them are children's fishing events. One of them is um, serving the Hope House, which is an um, organization that works with adults with disabilities and a nursing home. Um, so they're all some sort of event for children or, or those. Um, all in total, these are just under $40,000 for all eight of these events. We also have four research projects this year. These are also all reoccurring <laughs> projects. Um, that top one doesn't happen every year, but they are all ones that we've reviewed multiple times in the past. Items K and L are joint funded from both the Recreational and Commercial License Fund, and we do this because it serves both of those sectors um, on both of those projects. The last project, item M, is our only access project and only new-ish project this, this year. <laughs> this project is a request for funding for dredging and shoreline work at Curry Oman Landing. Now, what made this a little bit complicated and had a lot of review by RFAB is because the Curry Oman Landing boat ramp was originally funded by this fund in the mid-90s. Um, since the sort of adjacent spit you may be able to see in this map here has eroded and caused a lot of filling in on that turning basin, and by the spring, the boat ramp was completely unusable by basically anything other than a kayak. The county has acquired the property this year and has asked for funds to partially support the dredging and shoreline work on that spit. Um, I say partially support because typically we fund 75% or we can fund up to 75% from the license fund and ask the municipality to fund 25%. In this case, they're asking for 25%. Um, the entire project is about $486,000. Um, so it got a lot of review just because of that history with the RFAB board, but it did have a lot of public support, both from members of the community and from Senator Stewart. The RFAB did vote to recommend approval. And the last item, um, RFAB meeting expenses and all the travel budget for that is also funded through the license fund. Now in 1994, $46,000 was set aside for that. Um, you know, in that time, we've used it up. So staff is asking for an additional allotment of $40,000 to replenish that fund. Um, I expect this will take quite a long time to work through. Staff recommendation is funding projects A through M and the additional travel allotment for the advisory board for expenditures totaling $529,426 from the Recreational License Fund and $88,502 from the Marine and Fishing Improvement Fund. Does anybody have any questions? Questions of Alicia? I have a request. We, through this program, uh, administer a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and as the commission, and again, as the, 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 the fiduciary agents of this money, um, I think it would be really <clears throat> interesting to have a report. Okay. Um, and it's something that would be suitable for public dissemination uh, and, if, and if we have to make the request to the rec board to get that done, and I'm not talking about just some papers like this. I would like to have something done that shows the public who buys a fishing license where these funds are going and what good things are being done. Um, and, and I want it, again, if, if possible, to to just look like some of the stuff that comes out of VIMS, as pretty as it is. So anyway, um, they probably can help you with that as our advisors and economics and things like that. So I think that would be good. We, we, we've gone through a number of these different cycles with a lot of money that goes through there. And again, unless you read the minutes, nobody knows where this money's gone. Right. So I think it'd just be important for us to either that or have something we can publish on the website as well, but something to give an idea and what good things that this actually does for those when they buy their license. So that's just a request. Mr. Uh, Tankard? Yeah, so the boat ramp and dredging that they want to do, mm -hmm. could you just return to that? I mean, is it, do, you, do you have any sense that this is going to be something sustainable or are we just going to be dredged, something that will be filled back in next year? That was actually a lot of the comments on um, from the rec board was saying, you know, that's, that's a little spit, there's a lot of fetch, what's going to happen? So it was reviewed um, by VIMS. We had peer review saying that this could be a permanent fix. 
The big difference between now and when we funded this in 1996 is that any new access project has a portion of that contract that says that this has to be maintained for a certain amount of time. Uh -huh. So if this fills back again next year, the county will be responsible for dredging it again and keeping that open for the next 20 years, or they have to re refund a portion of the money. So we sort of had that, have that included in all of our new contracts. It wasn't in place in 1996, but it is now. Great. And not to mention, very seldom, as Alicia had indicated, do we get project applications for 25% of the project. Yeah. I mean, they got a lot of skin in this game, so I think it's, it would behoove them to, to okay. keep it straight as well. So. Okay, thank you for that. Further questions or comments? Not the matters before the commission. This is, does not require a public hearing. Anybody wish to be heard on the matter? Seeing none, the matters before the commission. I, re I re uh, recommend our, excuse me, <laughs> what am I trying to do? Move for uh, the recommended funding of the projects A through M. So second to the motion. Second by Ms. Everett. Further discussion? Uh, just to discuss. Yes, sir, Dr. Neal. With, with his motion, I'm assuming he also means the additional travel allotment also. Oh, yes, excuse but, me, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Is that, that amendment okay with you, Mr. Everett? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you for another year. <laughs> Item number 18, request for public hearing pertaining to commercial electrofishing. <laughs> sounds like my kind of fishing. <laughs> Yours is dynamite. <laughs> Pretty sure that's illegal in Virginia. <laughs> Only if you're caught. Some anyway. <laughs> Which is why we have great marine police and conservation officers to make sure that doesn't happen. All right, so this is a request for public hearing. Proposal to establish Chapter 4 VAC 20-1360 pertaining to commercial electrofishing to create a commercial electrofishing license and fishery. Blue catfish are an invasive species that were introduced to Virginia tributaries in the 1970s as a game fish. Their introduction was very successful fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, and began outcompeting the native catfish. The population exploded, and in a study by Mary Fabrizio, uh, in one section of the James, she found a density of 544 fish per hectare. This is a recreational blue catfish catch, which is harvest and releases in Virginia, as well as the number of trips. You can see it's really been increasing since about the mid-2000s, and it's it supports a lot of people, um, a lot of money. There's a lot of charter fisheries on the James River for the sole purpose of taking trophy blue cats. And then this is commercial blue catfish harvest in Virginia, as well as the number of trips. This has also been increasing partially as, partially more people are targeting them, but partially since the population is growing, more people are encountering them, often in um, gill nets, I believe. This is blue catfish harvest, uh, commercial by gear. The majority is from pots and traps, which does include the traditional hoop net fishery. And in the orange bars uh, down here, this includes other gears as well, um, such as handline, haul seine, and <coughs> an experimental electrofishing project. In electrofishing, a shock unit, a generator powered pulsator, is on a metal boat that pulses current to stun fish while harvesters on chase boats use dip nets to bring the fish on board. The electrical current can be fine-tuned to target certain groups of species. For example, uh, catfish are susceptible to a low frequency, whereas most of your riverine species such as bass, uh, perch, trouts are uh, susceptible to high frequencies. Fish are stunned, usually for a matter of seconds before recovering and fish can actually build a tolerance to this over short time periods. So if you shock the same area day after day after day, less fish will come to the surface every time. Uh, fishermen usually have to wait um, about seven to 10 days before the fish become as susceptible as they began. Uh, electrofishing is often used as a survey technique, often um, used by uh, research institutions and managers. And the usability depends on salinity and temperature. The way uh, electricity moves through the water depends on the conductivity, which is a factor of salinity, temperature, and total dissolved uh, solids in the water. 
So that changes based on where you are in the rivers and time of year. This is an example of an electrofishing boat. So what you see, the upside down uh, umbrella there, those are the anodes which go into the water. The aluminum vessel acts as the cathode and uh, the fish are drawn into towards the anode and stunned at the surface where either they can dip net from the boat or from, as I said, chase boats. From 2014 to 2017, a fishery resource grant supported an experimental permit for commercial electrofishing. These experiments tested the feasibility of commercial electrofishing. Uh, one year they reported they averaged about 4,000 pounds a day of blue catfish and flathead catfish. Uh, time of year, connectivity restrictions. Most harvest was raised between 23 and 30 degrees Celsius. A uh, few fish were raised after high rain events late in the year. Um, they, uh, the, the grant, they fished late September. A big storm came in in October. October 6th, he raised barely enough fish. Uh, user conflicts with traditional hoop nets, that's been of some concern. They found no difference in catch of the hoop nets with nearby electrofishing. And then they also showed differences in optimal temperatures and bottom contours. Uh, one prefers structure, the other um, open ground and hoop nets, the fish don't, uh, the quality isn't as good during high temperatures, whereas electrofishing conductivity is best at the high temperatures. And the grant also tested for optimal harvest gear and electroshocking units. Staff's proposal, which we have worked on with VIMS and DGIF, is to make three licenses available, one each for the James, Pamunkey, and Rappahannock rivers. Licensees will either have pre previous experience electrofishing catfish or have a history of commercial catfish harvest in Virginia. And licensees must show completion of an approved safety and operations training course. Staff recommends advertising a December public hearing to establish Chapter 4 VAC 20-1360 pertaining to commercial electrofishing to create a commercial electrofishing license and fishery. Uh, we asked for the December public hearing because in November we will be holding an informational meeting for interested applicants. And I can take any questions or we have Bob Fisher of VIMS who is a technical advisor on the experimental permit who can also ask questions about electrofishing as a gear. Questions by members of the commission? What? Go ahead, Dr. Neal. It is, uh, so, we, uh, so Dr. Fisher's here? Yes. And, uh, I guess my first question is, is he going to be here at the public hearing? He will not. He will be out of town. Oh, so we have had questions. We better ask today, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, then I, I think I know some of these answers. Are we concerned about interactions with any other species? Uh, like I started. said, different species react differently to the temperature, to the, um, the current, the frequency. Sturgeon in most studies have shown to be susceptible to higher frequencies. Um, most studies that I've seen on sturgeon have recommended low frequency, which this will be low frequency electrofishing to not harm sturgeon. Can I have a follow up on that? On the same, if we do encounter a sturgeon during the course of this activity and it's stunned, is that considered a take? follow up on that, if it's considered a take, then what's after that? What is the, what is the circumstances or ramifications of, of that? We don't have an ITP for electroshocking. If, if, if NIMS and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service feels we should have an incidental take program, we'd have to you know, get an incidental take program. So, so the, Alexa, so the bottom line is it behooves us to make sure, to Dr. Neal's point, that this is not going to encounter Dr. Fitch, would you like to be heard on this? I'll answer any questions you have. <clears throat> My question is, is this going to impact sturgeon to your best of your ability? Not to our knowledge. DGIF felt that. Don't mean you work you. One of the comments from DGIF has felt that they've been using electroshocking to do their survey on blue cats, and they feel that it's, it doesn't have an impact on sturgeon. Because they use the same type of electrofishing in the same areas their yearly surveys. 
now, now that I've interrupted your train of thought. Do you no, that, was, that was kind of, you know. Yeah. So basically, if we had him here today, if we got any other questions for Vims, yes. I guess it would be the time to ask him since we're not going to have him this summer. You know, this is this is an exciting thing that y'all have been looking at for several years. Uh, it, it Putting electricity in the water to stun fish scares me. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, but I, you know, I trust that y'all have been looking at it. And, yeah. and, and just like this, that our shrimp fishery that you're developing, that scares me too. Uh, but I appreciate the safeguards and, and the incremental stuff you're doing with it. And we plan on having observers out on these on some of these trips as well. And uh, what we'll do for the public meeting, we'll invite uh, DGIF here as well. So if they have any, you know, they've been very helpful with us. So if there's any questions that they can answer based on their experiences during their surveys, we'll have them here. And as for if user conflicts are scaring you at all, um, we are recommending this to only be conducted on weekdays. So there will be no electro fishing from noon on Friday through the end of Sunday. So that way, the days people are most likely to be out um, looking for those trophy blue catfish, um, there will be no electro fishing on the water. If they want to come off Fort Monroe and fish, it'd tickle me to death because they're out there. Actually, uh, yeah, our, our MRIP uh, interceptions do show a blue catfish right off of our fishing pier. Oh, I know. I'm not kidding yep. you. Yeah, there, uh, uh, pound nets, really, and, uh, off of Kip to Peak, absolutely. Wow. They have developed an affinity and a, a ability to adapt to, to salt water. The wow. major problem was that last year with all the rain, the bay became a lot fresher, so they managed to find little Pockets. fresher pathways over. Mr. France? Yeah, are we getting any opposition from the other commercial fisheries, like hoop netters or, or even uh, people that fish recreationally hand line to go in an area that's been shocked? We've mostly spoken to recreational anglers at this time. Uh, they do have some reservations, but a lot of them feel this is beneficial actually to them. Can you explain because, that, please? Yes, What's sir. beneficial? Um, the population was introduced, and what happens is they've got a brand new environment. The population shoots up, they can eat as much as they want. Now they're starting to reach some sort of saturation point, and they're finding, uh, DGIF is finding that they're growing slower. So less fish are achieving that trophy size. Wow. So most of the anglers we've been hearing from say, as long as you're targeting the smaller fish, it will benefit them as well. And Mr. France, to that point, as far as conflict, my biggest concern, number one, we have to worry about, as we talked about at PRFC before, the, processing capability is that going to be there the other thing that worries me is by doing this is it going to flood the market to the detriment of the hoop matter mm -hmm. so we need to look at all of these things as we're going through this and we've never really had a chance to do this this way before mm -hmm. we've had what got us here is we've had experimental permits that I right. would sign off before but we've gotten to the point where we've gotten enough science that I don't think it justifies an experimental permit under the code so now we're going this route which is the next kind of like a baby step mm -hmm. that we have to really be careful, with, but we'll do the best we can to make sure all of those aspects are covered. Right. Well, I, and you know, I, I agree with this totally and, and look forward to any kind of way to get rid of blue catfish or at least to get their numbers down yes. because, you know, where I come from, it, it's a big problem in the Northern Neck area, the upper Rappahannock and the upper Potomac. Um, but I, I, I am getting some uh, some calls from some like hoop netters and, and pound netters that that uh, and, and potters that uh, target catfish, uh, and they're concerned about whether this will hurt their fishery. We we have been discussing. We'll keep an eye on, and if it does, uh, we can shut it down just as quickly as we open it and try to figure out another way to take care of this matter. And, when yeah. we, and yeah. as far as I'm concerned, we should. If, there, if the conflicts outweigh the benefits just like everything we do and it becomes apparent that that's what's going on whether it's market viability or uh, or any other type of problem uh, I think we should Mr. Tiger. I'm surprised Mr. Jenkins in here today I know this was something that was on has been on his agenda for uh, at least a dozen years and he's a accomplished fisherman and waterman from the here neck mm -hmm. of the woods and he, mm -hmm. he's mentioned that he thinks it's been a detriment to the blue car crab fishery Significantly so. So I'm all for it. And no. I'll ask we'll the question is that Rob on the bow of that boat? That is indeed. <laughs> good doctor standing out there. Yes, sir, come forward. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, absolutely you can. If you would come up here, state your name for the record, please, and 
give us any pearls of wisdom that you have, sir. Yes, I am Bob Fisher from VIMS Advisory Service Program. Um, part of the FRG coordinators uh, who funded this research for four years, <coughs> looking at uh, low frequency electrofishing. But uh, specific to the questions about gear conflict, um, I'll address that, but I want everyone to keep the frame of mind that this gear type is only functional under certain parameters, environmental parameters, meaning temperature, as Alexa has indicated, uh, and conductivity. Um, Which means time of year. Time of year. This, th this gear type will only be functional from mid-May to mid-September in our Virginia waters. And that is directly associated with the summer months here, where a lot of times gear, gear conflict would be minimized because a lot of the hoop netters and other fishers don't typically fish as strong and tense during the summer because they're bait fouls quicker and, and they're a bait fishery. Uh, addressing the gear conflict, we did that in year three of this, of our program where we were getting some comments from our traditional fishers, especially the hoop netters saying that after, or if shocking occurred near their set gear, that the fish were tending not to go to bait anymore. So we took this uh, conflict seriously. We uh, had a whole, nut, whole program, the whole month long in 2016, a whole summer long in 2016 where we employed a hoop netter, a commercial hoop netter, and gave him free access on the Pamunkey River to set his traps anywhere that he traditionally would to target blue catfish how they would. So what habitat that he chose was what traditionally the gill net or the hoop netters would choose. All we asked is that he kept them at least a quarter, a third of a mile apart. So what we did is we flipped a coin at the beginning of the study to decide which net we were going to ship or shock over and which one we were not. So we were going to shock over one, skip one, shock over the next in a series like that. So to really get an indication if shocking did physiologically affect the catfish and made them go off a of bait to test the, what, what the concerns were. So we did this for uh, all through the summer and statistically, at the end of the day, at the end of the study, there was no difference in catch rates between nets that we shocked over in their catch and ones that we did not shock over. And as uh, Alexa alluded to, there's a desensitizing effect that comes with this species, with this gear type. By the end of the study, we were getting zero catch, even though our depth finders, our fish finders showed there was plenty of catfish underneath us, we could not shock them. Uh, while the, the hoop netters continued to have catch. So there's a lot of, you know, functionality things that make this a very functional gear type. It's highly selective. It will affect, once you uh, set the current into the water, a text current, or a, uh, a pulsed frequency, we get anywhere from the very small fish to the 80 pound fish. It does not discriminate against size. Uh, the selectivity process comes by the person dipping what's on the surface. So to give you guys a picture, I wish I had an opportunity to show you a, a film of, of this process. So if I was, my shock boat was in the middle, I put my fed, pedal on there and created a current in the water. This whole room would fill up within seconds of fish that would become uh, galvanotaxis, they get stunned and they come to the surface. So any size fish from this size to the 80 pounders would be available to harvest. Remember, that gear type only brings them and makes them susceptible to being harvested. The selectivity comes from the person who's actually dipping them. And how long were they stunned for normally? When, <clears throat> it, between there. 60 and, and 90 seconds you have to collect the fish before they regain and go back to their bottom oh. habitat. Dr. Neal? Wow. Uh, what other species do you see coming up? None. Okay. It's, uh, I've been on most of the trips throughout uh, several of the seasons and tremendous of volume. We were getting 28 pounds per minute um, and I didn't see any other fish species other than catfish. Given it affects the white catfish, our native catfish, as a saying, you know, just like the other catfish. 
but those are always returned. And just a, as a note, we rarely see our native catfish anymore because the blue catfish have just totally dominated the, the biomass. Um, Mr. Ballard, do you see other species uh, collecting the stunned blue cats? Um, are there predators in the area that are um, No. Most, the only thing we see as predators are the gulls and the eagles, okay. which was very interesting. The very first year we did this, uh, you could see the, the gulls and the eagles come and test some of the fish, the small ones up, and they would release them. You know, the first year they, they, didn't, they weren't conditioned to having that type of fish to surface that to feed on. Because if you're familiar with the catfish, they have the, the very sharp barbs on the sides and in the dorsal. Um, but by year two, boy, it was a feeding frenzy. And the thing that came to the top, the, the, the tons of birds and stuff would feed on them. But as far as aquatic um, predators, no. Further questions? When is this public hearing? December. December? Yes. Why not November when he could be here? Our thought was to allow time for the informational meeting for, um, and then also so we do not overlap with the straight bass public hearing. Okay. So you don't All have right. two yeah, well, weighty issues. I just, just want to make sure this is a, a scenario that looks really, really good, but if we don't get the information out that needs to get out, it can grow legs, make sure we get as much information, just like you just provided us was great. Um, um, so whatever we can do to do that. And By the way, there is a, a great, uh, I watched it yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, you can go to Electro Fishing on YouTube. North Carolina um, Department of Fisheries has got one on there that shows exactly how it's done. It's pretty good. So we'll have one to show maybe next year. So anyway. And Commissioner, I can also speak to your concern about processing capacity. Yes. What we have heard from processors is some have stopped processing catfish because if they get a trickle of catfish over a long period of time, it's not worth it to have the inspectors. Yep. When they receive a large amount at once, it is worth it to have the inspectors on premises. So several that have gotten out of the game have said they are interested in getting back in with the electrofishing, providing them with product. Just as long as they take the catfish from our hoop netters as well, I'll be happy for sure. Yes, they uh, won't do discriminate. I was uh, out of one of your processors yesterday helping okay. them get their processing line, their, their filleting and skinning, skinning machines in, in line, they are ramping up to handle this. And so okay. I, I, I suspect others will be getting into that processing sector as well. Not to, is, is that pretty much local, the processor? Yes. Okay, good, because. And um, that's, that's one of our directives. We've been trying to enhance the value of this species. Before it would just come in in the round and be shipped out of state in the round. And so any rendering to add value to it was not done prior to yeah. when we started electrofishing and working with industry on, on, on receiving this large volume at one time type thing. Because I've got a friend who's known since we were children that fishes up around Claremont that uh, takes all this to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So this is, mm -hmm. sounds pretty good. The Potomac River Fisheries Commission um, just had a memo they were advertising a couple months ago with a list of local processors that do handle blue catfish yeah. in Virginia and Maryland. Okay. Further questions? Okay, what's the pleasure of the commission? Thank you so very much, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, on the public hearing. So I guess yep. before you, yeah, you know, sure. do, would you think we should go for a November public meeting as opposed to December? I mean, I don't want to get into the, I really, you know, Lyle or someone or Dr. Lukenbach who finally got his directions to where he was going. Um, <laughs> can, uh, uh, can, well, can somebody, someone be here that can, from VIMS that can? And, and like I said, we'll make sure we have somebody from TGIF. The DJIF has been very helpful in this process. We actually went up to, they had a public hearing with uh, their recreational anglers, and it was Rob, Alexa, and myself. And it was fairly hostile to begin with. Alexa gave a presentation, and they were all concerned, and they had a lot of the same questions. And DGIF did a very good job of saying, no, those are not, that's not the fact. This is, we need to do this. By the end of the meeting, they were all supportive of doing this for their purposes to increase the trophy fishing. Well, here's the deal, Mr. Gear. What I'd like to have, as far as this public hearing is concerned, is I don't want any questions to go unanswered if possible. Okay. How's that? We'll, we'll do our best. Good enough. So Emphasi emphasis added. 
Mr. Tankard. I'll move to approve the public hearing for uh, uh, December. Motion made by Mr. Tankard to public hearing in December. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. France. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Next item, request for public hearing pertaining to striped bass. Mr. Aspinwall, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Commission members. Let's see here, okay. So this is a, a request for public hearing to amend Chapter 4 BAC 20-252 pertaining to the taking of striped bass to establish the 2020 striped bass commercial quota for the Chesapeake Bay and coastal areas and implement a 28 inch commercial maximum size limit in the Chesapeake Bay area from March 15th through June 15th. So the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is going to hold their 78th annual meeting at New Castle, New Hampshire, uh, October 28th through October 31st. Uh, it will be during this meeting that the ASMSC Striped Bass Management Board uh, will be taking final action on both recreational and commercial measures under draft addendum 6 and that will be on October 30th. Uh, one of those decisions they'll be making is making adjustments to quota for the commercial, which approach to go with. Uh, one is a 1.8% reduction in commercial quota, which is based on the proportional removal from the commercial sector, or an 18% reduction in commercial quota, which is the total reduction shared equally amongst the recreational and commercial sectors. Um, once that decision is made, um, we're going to provide that to the Commission next month during the public hearing. So on the other hand, the Chesapeake Bay uh, does have a commercial maximum size limit season uh, that currently runs March 26th through June 15th, um, and it's in place to protect the spawning age females as they migrate out of the Chesapeake Bay. Historically, we've had a, a season that, that starts a little bit earlier, approximately two weeks earlier, starts on March 15th. Uh, instead of March 26. Um, in response to the stock assessment that indicates that the spawning stock biomass is overfished, um, staff is requesting that we, we adopt the historical season just as a larger window to protect the spawning uh, females as they leave the bay. Staff recommends advertising for a November public hearing uh, to amend Chapter 4, 20-252, pertaining to the taking of striped bass to establish a 2020 striped bass commercial quota for the Chesapeake Bay and coastal areas and implement a 28-inch commercial maximum size limit in the Chesapeake Bay area from March 15th through June 15th. And with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions of Alex by members of the commission? Mr. France. Yes, yes. You know, I have no problem with going to 28-inch uh, fish on March the 15th. Yeah, let me go back for you. Yeah. yeah. But uh, on March the 26th, the way we presently had it, it between there and April 1st is there a net size change or, or does it go to a minimum size I'm not sh I'm not sure on that and, and if it does do we need to, to move that back some also it's, it's as if I'm aware it's just a maximum size limit um, we do now have a seven inch maximum right, right. mesh size on that fishery is it uh, does anybody know No, I don't believe we do. It doesn't go to a six inch or anything like that? Up in the rivers and the spawning areas, there's that six and, a half, six, inch, six and a half inch mesh size restriction that comes in during the spawning periods. So now that we put that seven inch, it, they still coincide. There's, there won't be anything that we have to adjust with those mesh size to coincide with that 28. Okay. Further questions? Uh, Mr. Tankard. I guess I, I'll have to ask the question that I continually get over and over again is why are we even bothering to catch, why are we catching fish in, in the spring when we know this is when they're spawning? I mean, uh, everywhere I go, people say, why are you letting people catch fish, the commercial guys catch these fish in the spawning time periods? Do we, can, do we have to do this? No, and so I think one of the reasons why we have this, we're, we're asking to push it back is to reduce the amount of potential harvest of these large fish that you're referring right. to. So. Um, so that's really the purpose of, of, of this um, request. So, so I'll follow up, Mr. Tiger. Follow up. So, could would we have the option of, of, of uh, ha not having a spring harvest? Uh, I mean, when we 
when we meet again? I mean, can we? Is there any option for doing that? I mean, well, the the commercial fishery is unique in that if you were to, you know, we discussed this as staff. If you were to take part of their season away, that they would just adjust their effort accordingly, Correct. and so you may not have any savings with that. So putting a maximum size limit during a certain part of the season would still allow them to fish, but not harvest as many large fish as they could if the season was smaller. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I understand that part. Okay. Kind of like displaced effort, you know, either you want it over a period or you want to hammer it. Yeah. Further questions? No, just a comment. Yes, yeah. sir, Mr. France. Kind of, uh, to go with what Mr. Ba uh, Mr. Tanger said here, uh, you know, in our areas on the Rappahannock of Potomac, most of the time, the big spawning females aren't getting there until the, somewhere around the 13th to 15th of March. So the, the net size adjustment and stuff hits it about right. So you're happy with this? Is what you're I think so, yes. Okay. For the questions or comments? Seeing none, the matters before the commission. Move to accept a request for public hearing. Motion made by Dr. Neal for public hearing on striped bass. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Move. Second by Mr. Ballard. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. <coughs> Thank you. Sure. Any of anyone else have any matter before the commission? Come forward, Mr. Luckford. You, you've always been a Absolutely. great guy and a supporter, and sometimes give I, us what we need. But I, anyway, I try. Thank you, you sir. I appreciate it. Today. Yes, sir. I, I just um, I know I missed the public comment, and, and generally, you know, for a long time, the public comment, you know, generally happened after lunch. I would love to see that come back. But anyway, if I could, well, it is right now. Okay. I thank you, sir, and I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity. Yes, sir. Um, sure. The only thing I would like to bring to the attention, and we'll probably bring it to the attention uh, to the of finfish, um, is the need for a small bycatch fishery on speckled trout right now. Um, the speckled trout season was closed. Um, as you know, it's it's more of a uh, haul seine fishery um, mm -hmm. with, a, with a window that's unusual and it's opening and closing and geared towards that. Um, we still have people fishing for spot, uh, mainly with gill nets, catching a lot, you know, not a lot. I should say, uh, uh, you know, even 100 pounds of bycatch, it, it wouldn't be a directed fishery. But just something to, to help with those discards and also, you know, bring some value to the trip of the day. What's speckled trout going for a pound now? Oh, you know, anywhere from upwards of two fifty, three dollars a pound. Yeah. I mean, and, and some are higher in some cases. Um, and, and again, the fear should not be that because of the value that the people would target them. It's mainly spot fishing. Um, I think last week they dipped as low as dollar twenty five before the closure. But truly, here with this this small amount, um, even even 50 pounds, you know, would, would just help throwing back, you know, dead discards. Um, so if we could just, you know, have the commission look at that, or at least be, um, you know, open-minded to it, maybe we can work that through finfish. May may I, I don't know if it'll be timely enough for this time of year, but maybe we could, you know, put something together. Um, it's not. It's been fairly mild thus far. And it's for you know it's a chance we'll probably keep fishing for roundhead and some other fish that may interact with the speckled trout. Appreciate the uh, the um, staff looking into that. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for the time. Thank Appreciate you for that. your time. Anything else to come before the commission? I'd like to compliment staff, Habitat, Fisheries, Law Enforcement, all for a great job today. Uh, a lot of different moving things that we're doing now, and y'all doing a great job. So. Thank you so very much. Yeah, I, 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 I would Tanker. like to just say one thing. It was very nice to hear from Mrs. Uh, Craddock. Craddock, how, what a great job Mrs. Peabody had done because there's not many times that I've been at public hearings where the audience compliments staff. In fact, that might be the only way to, uh, not our staff, just <laughs> staff of whatever it might be, county officials, health department officials. Very seldom have I ever seen that in my life. I think we've got a great group here and they do a good job, but I appreciate that, that, uh, that comment. For the comments, we get y'all out of here before the traffic jam. Yeah. Meeting adjourned.